What do you say to end a letter? What do you say to end a big letter? What do you say to end a big letter uh, when, if you were saying it in person, there would be a lot of tears? What do you say when by blessings, ta or TTFN just won't cut it? Uh, for those of you who don't follow Winnie the Pooh, TTFN is ta ta for now. How do you end a letter like 1 Corinthians? I was a youth pastor uh, and congregational pastor at Gordon Baptist Church for five years. And in that last service, uh, it was a very difficult and emotional time uh, because I'm trying to leave my last words. And in doing so, there were echoes of all the other sermons that I had given, all the other ministry that I had done with these people for the last five years. Because I wanted them to remember this stuff as I was leaving, that it would encourage them that they could grow. And then here, Paul does something similar. In the final closing chapter of this great big book of 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul uses echoes and refrains from other teaching that he has encouraged them with throughout the letter as he seeks to encourage uh, encourage them. And he does this uh, by focusing on uh, giving and offering uh, through uh, looking at leadership and then through a last comment on Christian faith as a whole. Now, this is our last sermon in 1 Corinthians, uh, and it has been a big, long sermon, a sermon series, and at times a lot more challenging than I had naively expected. But as we come to the end of this, it is a good time for us in our quiet times to possibly re-read through 1 Corinthians and remind ourselves of what God has been teaching us through this series. And I'd encourage you to do that. But then at that same time, if uh, there are questions that come up and if there are uh, issues that have arisen for you that this, past, that this book raises, uh, then please talk to me, uh, message, text, Insta, DM, whatever your form of a social media inquiry is, that's fine. But then also, if you really get stuck on a passage, one idea is to go back uh, to the sermons that we have already done. They were all available on YouTube uh, because of the ministry of Danny. And so you can easily go back there and remind yourself in that way as well. Or perhaps if you had missed one, that's another option. Um, Now, Paul, throughout his letter, has raised certain things that he has heard that the Corinthian church is doing. And he has attempted to address them. Um, Things like taking each other to court, uh, sexual immorality, uh, creating divisions and chaos in the church service. And he's wrapping it all up by riffing on previous parts of the letter. Um, Often when you go and see a movie, especially if it's part of a series, in the middle of the movie you'll pick up on a riff of the main theme. For most of us will know the main theme of a movie or series, but then they take that theme and they vary it to fit the context of a specific scene. Um, They change it a little bit, but they're still riffing on the main theme of the the, uh, tune of the series. A great example of this is Harry Potter. Uh, So that, that riff, right, you hear that throughout the series in different contexts and different scenes. Same thing happens for Star Wars, same thing happens for Indiana Jones. Uh, Thor, the trailer for Thor, The Love of God and Thunder, um, that in the teaser trailer, it uses one song, and then in the main trailer, it takes that song and then riffs on it and varies it a little bit. Well, that's kind of what Paul is doing. In wrapping up his letter, he is riffing on the main themes that he's been trying to encourage the Corinthian church the whole way through. And you can see it as we go. And he does that uh, through a look at his mission itinerary, at a look at greetings from friends, and then from a final word. Now, I used to, uh, at previous churches, I used to run trivia nights. Uh, we used to run them at pubs. Uh, Sam's been, helped me run one, um, a couple. Uh, and, and we run them at pubs, and, and they're great nights. Um, but before we get to the good stuff, and before we get to the questions about uh, Bart Simpson's verbiage on his shorts, or what the two uh, animals on the 50 cent coin really are, um, we have to do the administration stuff. Uh, you know, the important, the necessary stuff. It's not the fun stuff, but we still have to do it. Like, uh, in case of an emergency, your exits are here and here. Uh, like the toilets, uh, you have to go down a lane and, uh, and hopefully get the key from the guy to open the door that gets you into the toilets. Um, all these, oh, and just a general idea of what's going on in the night. That's the administration. 
And Paul actually does that here as well. He does these things that is not getting into the deep theological intricacies. He's already done that. This is a more administrative. But if we look deeper and take a deeper look at this administrative things, we can actually see the rifts of the whole letter. And then we can also drag out some key and major application points that change how we're living today. Now, the first section in this final chapter is on giving. And it's interesting because in chapter 15, he's just spoken about the resurrection, a, a big peak of the letter, specifically in relation to uh, the resurrected bodies uh, that we will one day have. And right after that theological epiphany, he goes straight into uh, a collection, the gathering of money. And in one sense, it feels a little bit like a sharp turn. It's like, whoa, where did that come from? But for, for Paul, it makes complete sense to to weld together theology and practical application, um, belief and action. That makes complete sense in Paul's understanding and one of the reasons he puts them both here today. Uh, then verse one to three. Now about the collection for God's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot going on here. First up, uh, what is he talking about collecting money for God's people? Well, in Galatians 2.10, Paul said that when he had been in Jerusalem, uh, the apostles asked him to remember in his travels the needs of his, the fellow churches in Jerusalem. And that is what the money collected in Galatians and other churches like the church in Corinth is used for, the church in Jerusalem. But why does the church in Jerusalem need the money? Well, there's a whole heap of possible understandings of this. Uh, there was a, uh, in the 40s, there was a famine, and so that would have been very difficult for people. Added to this, there already uh, Jerusalem had a high level of poverty uh, even before that. On top of this, you get the idea that a whole heap of poor people flocked to the church. And we see this in the widows in Acts 6 as an example. And so the church had a significant ministry to those who didn't have heaps of money. Then on top of this, when a person became a Christian, they were no longer able to, ha to have access to the money and the food that was given by the Jew Jewish religion to those who were suffering. So that door of opportunity had kind of closed, meaning that there was a bigger onus on the church to provide for these people. Um, and so that's possibly what was going on here. There's a suffering in the church in Jerusalem and those in Corinth and other places, are, are, and those who are more well off, are asked to help and aid that church. Then the next point is how does that collection take place? It's interesting that here in this passage, we get the first roots of our understanding of church offering. Um, and it's done by uh, keeping, giving a certain amount, of, putting a certain amount of money aside once a week. Uh, for them, that, the first day of the week was Sunday uh, because they only had the Sabbath. They didn't have a two-day weekend like we do. We would see Monday as the first day of the week. But for them, they would put aside money on the Sunday. Now, they wouldn't give that money to the church. They would put it aside, collect it and keep it at their home, ready for when Paul comes, and then they would give, be able to give it to him. So the idea is less money uh, in an offering bag and more about a piggy bank on top of the fridge or the ancient Near East equivalent of such, and then putting money in it. And then Paul comes and then collects it. So an example of this is there was a lady in a church I was in uh, where she wasn't able to come to church, but she every week she dutifully set aside money for the church, her, her offering to give. And so when I came to visit her, she would give me an envelope uh, with the money uh, to be able to give to the church. And so that's an example of that happening. But this concept is set aside a sum of money. Um, weekly giving is established here systematic, self-disciplined, and consistent generosity. This is not just the Christmas Day or Easter, Good Friday giving of some religions and denominations. This is consistent and thought through and giving generously. 
What's more is, the amount set aside was, verse 2 be very important, in keeping with his income, or more literally, to whatever extent one is prospered. The idea behind this is if you get more, then you are to give more. Often in the church, when we talk about giving, we have this understanding of the tithe. Uh, the tithe was an Old Testament concept of giving 10% of our gross, uh, sorry, of our uh, first uh, fruits, our gross income, uh, setting that aside and giving that to the church. Okay? However, in the New Testament, never is it endorsed for us to give a tithe. Uh, it is noted, but it's not endorsed as a modern church equivalency. Instead, we are consistently uh, encouraged to give generously, but it's never just packaged in a nice, neat little 10% box. So in our minds, as a church, the 10% number should always be the starting point and not the finishing point. It is the beginning of the conversation and not the full stop. Often what we do is we think, I have tithed, we have given enough, no issue. But yet the biblical, specifically New Testament concept, I think allows for a lot more wiggle room of generosity than that. Um, for example, let's look at our tax system. In our tax system, if you are on a higher wage, then the percentage of money that you give to the government increases. Um, if you are on less, you will possibly give no tax in some situations, but if you're on a high amount of money, you could give you know, 30, 50% of your income goes to tax. That percentage changes. Well, then why don't we have that similar idea in relation to giving in the church? It seems a little bit foreign to me that a household who is on $200,000 a year or more would pay the same percentage as someone who is on the pension. And yet that's often what I have seen, and that has happened. I think we need to keep coming back to this idea in keeping with his income. Uh, Paul, when uh, he said this, never envisaged a, a strict vice-like grip on a 10% number and not a penny more. But then, if we're actually honest with ourselves, are we even giving 10%? At Nexus... Um, we have a, a suggested donation uh, that for every child who comes that they would bring a gold coin. Um, it's ideally $2. This is our goal, right? Uh, but often, like two weeks ago, we had $3 <laughs> after like a 13 kids came. Um, and so they're not fantastic at giving, and a lot of that is because the kids are, are from uh, households where they don't have a lot of money. Um, but there was this one guy who comes very regularly. He's a great kid, amazing heart. Uh, and he recently got a full-time job. He left school and is now working. And every once in a while, in the, in the basket, he'll put a $20 note. Or he'll put a $10 note. Because in his mind, on some level, he has understood that because he has more, he will give more. Uh, and he covers his friends and he covers a lot as a result of that. And it's a little bit awkward that a, youth, a, a kid in youth group, not from a Christian background is able to get this concept of giving in accordance to his income, where many of us in the church still do not. Well, we'll come back to that. Uh, and the next thing that Paul encourages is in relation to accountability and transparency of that giving. Um, his plan is that we can see in the passage uh, that Paul arrives uh, in the church chooses people, the church chooses people to take the money to Jerusalem. Uh, Paul writes a letter uh, of introduction and then that, that letter with the money is then sent to Jerusalem. The idea is that it's all above board and people know exactly what's going on, how much money is collected and it goes across. There is accountability and there's transparency in the use of the money that is given. And this is kind of a good point for us too in the church. We need to, as a church, be accountable and transparent for the money that is given to our church. Um, a key way of this is I don't touch money. Uh, so Giselle, Sam, Steve, they will attest that as, as often as possible, I do not touch church money. And the goal of that is to insulate myself from any accusations that I am dodgy or stealing from the church. I never want to do that, so I never want to have the access or possibility for that to incur. And that, and I forget stuff. And so between those two things, I try and not touch money as much as possible. But that is an attempt to do, in line of this, 
um, of being accountable with and transparent with money. It's interesting, a McCrindle study survey found that just 26% of churchgoers are satisfied, are extremely satisfied, sorry, with their church's financial transparency. 25% extremely satisfied with the church's transparency on money. That means 75% almost are not happy or satisfied or with the way that church does their money. That means we need to do better at this. We need to be better at this as a church. And one way that we do this, another way that we do this, is in terms of our AGM. We as a church have an AGM, an annual general uh, meeting, and in that we give a financial description of all the areas where money has gone. And we tell you exactly where the money uh, has, how it comes in and where it goes out. And then what we do is we have a budget, a plan of what uh, the next year is going to look like, where we envisage spending that money in the next year. And this is a way of us saying, okay, you guys have entrusted us with money. This is what we have done with it. This is what we are planning to do with it. You have a say. You have the possibility to say yes or no. You vote on the budget, and then we carry it through. And the goal of that is accountability and transparency. That no one, that, and the goal is that you would say, well, Michael, I don't agree with that amount of money spent on this. Is there a possibility we can spend more? We can spend less. And that has actually happened. Uh, people in the congregation have argued that we should spend more money on mission, and we have. And so that is a way of doing this and something that we want to encourage to continue to happen. But that requires you guys to come to the AGM. Um, and if you weren't able to make it last time, then please contact me or Steve, and we can give you the financial descriptions uh, and the budget for this year, as well as what we did last year and how we're going with that. Okay. So then um, that's giving. But then we need to look at it a little bit more personally. Um, now, it's worth noting that the, specifically here, the money that was being given out uh, wasn't raised for the church as much as it was for the suffering Christians in a worse off situation and context, okay? For brothers and sisters in the church that were far less well off than the church in Corinth. And we need to be aware of that as well. We too often have a Western Christian bubble which uh, leads us to having blinders on the poverty and the suffering of Christians in other nations, in Christians in other, uh, other parts of the world. Uh, I was at youth group and I explained that there are Christians still dying for their faith, being killed because they believe in Jesus and the youth group was shocked. Um, in Vietnam, I'm going to, uh, with my family, we're going, sorry, in September, we're going to Vietnam. And one of the goals there is to visit an orphanage um, because I want my kids to have their worldview expanded about how the other half of the world lives, how the third world country operates. I want to take them to an orphanage where they will meet children with no technology, no screens, no iPad, no switches, uh, no Wi-Fi, and are still happy. I was practicing this sermon and my kids were around and they were shocked no Wi-Fi? <laughs> it's like, oh, no, how do they survive? They actually said that. Um, but I want them to see that because I, they have sheltered, they are sheltered. They don't understand what is going on over there and how much suffering there is for Christians in those parts of the world. We must understand. Uh, we must be challenged. And as a result of that, give and support Christians in other countries who are struggling worse off than we. Unfortunately, in the last 10 years, uh, Australia, Australian international aid has been declining. Um, we have gone down 31% between 2011 and 2020, where the global uh, foreign aid has increased 26%. This is not a good thing, and it's something that we must make sure never infects the church. But then are we giving? Are we giving to suffering Christians? Are we giving to the church? For while the specific context is for suffering Christians, the principle of giving can be extended to also include the church, but are we doing it? McCrindle Research found uh, that one in five churchgoers in Australia do not give regular offerings to the church. Uh, if we can see the next slide, Elijah, it should be up there. Uh, is that the next one? Yeah, there we are. Uh, so 44% give every week, 36% give monthly, but that leaves 20% that don't. Uh, this is not 20% uh, of seekers. 
This is not 20% of those who are curious. Those, this is not 20% of those who have been invited on a one-off to the church. This is 20% of regular church attenders who are giving nothing to the church. We in the West have so much, and yet we give so little. We need to be challenged on this. This is, not an, this is not a biblical application of giving. This is not generous and disciplined and sacrificial. And this is in the West where we have so much. What would it look like if the entire church gave, and I've already argued against it, but let's just have a starting point. Let's just think big out here, 10%. If everyone gave 10%, what would the church look like? Well, I can tell you right now, it would look a lot different to what it does today. It would look a lot different here. It would look a lot different in Australia. It would look a lot different in the world because the resources that the church had access to would have times a lot. American re uh, research study found that the average giving, total giving, including charity, of the American Christian was 3%. And while we are a different beast in Australia, I'm not sure we're much better off. We must be challenged on this that we would give in accordance with our income, that we would give generously and sacrificially. It's interesting that we come to this passage right on the end of May Mission Month, a month where we've been encouraged to support and pray for and give uh, to missionaries that we church as a church support. Uh, WEC, and there are many ways that we can do that, through WEC, through EHC, through World Vision, through Benong Gifts uh, that Grace in Asia has set out, um, class, etc. There's many ways we can, but are we? Well, that's offering. Paul then goes on to talk about leadership, and he does so by a travelling itinerary of what he, where he's going, and what he is planning to do. Um, and what Paul mentions is that he has a desire to come to Corinth, but not just to spend a short amount of time with them, to spend a long amount of time with them. We see this in verse six and seven. Perhaps I will stay with you a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. Paul often wants to revisit the churches that he has planted, to revisit them and follow them up, to encourage and mentor and rebuke if necessary. Paul wasn't happy to just evangelize and to move on. He wanted to disciple. And he knew that in order to effectively disciple a church, he needed to spend time with these people. Uh, not just quality time, but quantity time. Often uh, in uh, relationships, we often talk about quality time. Uh, that quality time does not include sitting in the couch watching TV. Uh, even if it is Bosch or How I Met Your Mum, even if you are touching hands at the same time, that is not quality time. In relationships, quality time is very important. But... In discipleship, yes, quality time is important, but so is just time time. And so is just being present in the room and, and doing so for a long period of time, having longevity in our relationships. In Bible college, they often talk about how pastors don't have a real impact in people's lives until they are there for five years. However, what we often see is that there is a trend of pastors hopping quite quickly between churches, and that is not helpful. Uh, is most effective if there is long-term, 5, 10, 20 years of ministry going on. And that is pastors. But then it also counts for the church. There is a mentality of church hopping, that we spend a short amount of period of time and then we go and check out another church and we go there because the music's better or because the preacher is better or just because it's closer. But rather we should be encouraged to commit in to a church long-term. I was talking to Barbara this week. She explained that she'd been at our church for 50 years. That's what I'm talking about. And there are many, I'm sure Enid and Marilyn, you're up there too, but that's what I'm talking about. Committing in long-term to a church, not leaving when it gets hard, not leaving when the number's a little bit down, not leaving when there's not at that time someone who is close to my age, but rather committing in and experiencing long-term discipleship. That is much far more effective. Uh, that's what... Um, that's what uh, Paul is encouraging here uh, through his desire to spend a long time, a pe uh, uh, time with these people. Again, I know I'm talking about youth group too much, and I do apologize for that. I will try and limit it. But it's interesting. Giselle has been a Nexus youth group leader for seven years. This year, uh, uh, Yusuf 
finishes uh, high school and so moves out of Nexus. He's been there since year seven. Actually, technically, he's been there since before year seven uh, as part of this youth group. And that is so fantastic that he's had this one leader who's been able to sow into his life, pray with him and love him for his entire high school career. That's not what we need to be looking towards. That's the model of ministry that is most effective. All right, so then that's one aspect. Then the next thing he talks about, I mean, he talks about a lot of things, but I want to focus on what he says about Apollo in verse uh, 12. Now, about our brother Apollo, I strongly urged him to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. Now, for those paying attention, all the way back in chapter 1, Apollo is mentioned as a, a perceived rival of Paul's. Uh, verse 1, verse 12, what I mean is this, one of you says I follow Paul, another I follow Apollos, another I follow Cephas, who is Peter, still another I follow Christ. And this concept is mentioned again in chapter 3. See, the church in Corinth saw that Apollo was a rival to Paul. Or who's better, Paul or, or, or Apollo? Who preaches better? Who has more effective ministry? Oh, I like how he talks about this better. I'm going to follow him. And Paul, the whole way through the, mess, the letter, is like, nah, it doesn't matter who gives you God's word as long as they're giving you God's word. It's, it's not a competition. It's not a race. Praise God that ministry is happening. He very much has this mentality of anti-competition in terms of church ministry. He doesn't care how people get saved, whether it's through his ministry or someone else's. He cares that they get saved. And I think this also needs to be an encouragement to us. Sometimes we can get a little competitive. Oh, that church is growing. Oh, why aren't we growing like them? Oh, that, that, that church pastor is far better at pastoral care. Oh, that church pastor is far better at administration. Oh, that church pastor is a far better preacher. Oh, why can't our guy be like that? Um, I apologize. But then also, um, it's not a competition. Uh, we are looking at partnering with churches around us, and I don't care where people go as long as they go to a church. Um, I don't care who uh, a person converts a person as long as they get converted. And that's Paul's method of ministry, and it needs to be ours. We need to take the competition away from church ministry, gospel ministry. Now, Hillsong is going through a really hard time at the moment, and a lot of people are laying into him. Uh, but whatever you say about Hillsong, they are preaching the gospel, and people are being saved. We as the church need to ex celebrate that. Praise God for the good stuff that they are doing. They might be doing it in a way that I don't necessarily agree. There might be some bits of their theology that I might not necessarily agree with, but people are being saved. There are people in heaven because of their ministry. Praise God. In our local area, we have three uh, churches uh, close to each other. We've got Campsie Baptist, Erwood Baptist, and Clempton Park Baptist. And right at the moment, Erwood Baptist is doing well. God is blessing them, and they have traction with young families. And I, and I have a temptation to go, oh, how come they're going over there? Why aren't they coming here? But that is a wrong thing to do. Praise God there are families going. Praise God people are hearing about Jesus. Praise God that is growing. Uh, we need to have more of that mentality than a competitive mentality in relation to the church. Okay, so the, Paul, that's kind of about leadership. And then Paul kind of wraps this up in chapter 16 with the final greetings, or like I, as I like to call it, by ye. Uh, verse 19, the churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord. And so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Um, it's like these guys send you greetings and these guys send you greetings and you all get greetings. But in doing so, Paul, what Paul is saying is here, we're united. We're on your side. Or in the historic words of High School Musical, we're all in this together. And that's how he views the church. And they're different churches and they're from different places, but they all care about you. They're all concerned about you. They're all praying for you. We are in this together. This idea of unity in the church is a key theme throughout the book. And he smashes it here as well. We are united. And, and in this context, you get the holy kiss. Um, now, the idea of the holy kiss was that it had the goal that Christians demonstrate their affections for one another in warm, interpersonal gestures of non-sexual intimacy. 
And so you do like the little, you know, we still do it in our, our culture as well, the hug and the kiss on the cheek, right? Uh, and different cultures do it in different ways. Um, often now, because of COVID, it's, it's down to a handshake. Uh, so we'll do the handshake. Sometimes we'll do the handshake. At, at youth group, they do the, our welcome is a handshake into a hug for the men. Uh, and the, then one pat and then out. You know, you can't, t- t- no, not three taps, that's too much. Um, and, but at youth group, they're trying to handshake and they do the handshake into the click. Like, I'm just too old. My joints are not set up for that. Um, But the whole concept of of that warm welcome is to extend this idea of unity and love, that we are a community, that we are a family, uh, that we are all in this together. Then the final point of the book as a whole can be found in verse 22. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. Come, O Lord. Now, Paul actually writes this uh, himself. The idea is that, that he had a scribe who was, he was dictating to, but he's got the pen himself for this last bit. And it's very interesting. In all the endings of Paul's letters, you need to look at what is distinctive, at what is different, of what happens in that letter, but not in other letters. And for Corinthians, this, this verse is what is distinctive. And he, the first part, if anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. He's spending all this time trying to rebuke and correct people who were doing dodgy things in the church. And finally, he goes, look, this is serious. You either love the Lord, you either love the church, or you will have a curse on you. This is serious. You must take this serious. It's like a full stop, a last attempt at hammering home a key point for the entire letter. Take my corrections, take my rebuke, take my advice, change the sin that you are doing in these areas that are leading you away from the true biblical Christ. Change. But if you don't change, there will be a consequence. Um, Often we see uh, people who come and have a late, come to the church for a period of time and they drift off and they never go to a church again. And sometimes this is important. We need to be as serious as this, as serious as Paul is on this. Uh, If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse is on his head. But then he he has this really serious point, but then the next step is, come, O Lord. Um, That the Greek is maranatha. And, And the idea behind it is take your eyes to the heavens. How awesome will it be? And he talked about this in 1 Corinthians 15. How awesome will it be when Christ returns? when he comes and gathers up all who are his, when he judges the living and the dead and he consummates in victory and establishes his, the new heavens and the new earth, which we will be with him for all eternity. Come, O Lord. See, often we have this idea that we try and create paradise on earth rather than looking forward and, and sowing into the paradise that is to come. Uh, there's a um, movie called, 1970s movie uh, called Heaven Can Wait. And in this movie, there is a professional footballer who is a quarterback who dies in a car accident and is really disappointed because, that he finds himself in heaven because he misses the Super Bowl. And the movie's all about him wanting to play the Super Bowl and wanting to go back to earth. And I think we have this mentality is, oh, just please, Lord, just don't take me until this moment, until I get this to happen in my life. But that is just, you're devaluing, you're minimizing what heaven is. How awesome that will be to think that anything on earth could come even close, that you would want to spend even a second on earth longer than what you would have to instead of in the new heavens and the new earth. In the last uh, big push, Paul is lifting their eyes to what is to come, lifting their eyes to that which makes it all worth it, lifting their eyes to the consummation and the victory of Jesus Christ on the cross. Come, O Jesus, come. We've talked about a lot of things this morning. We've talked about giving, uh, giving to the church, giving to uh, the suffering uh, Christians in uh, other countries, giving in a way that is generous, possibly uh, over the 10% tithe that we may have previously had in our head. We've talked about leadership, uh, accountability and transparency. We've talked about quantity time and discipleship. Uh, We've talked about having a view of the church that is bigger than our local community. A church being united and and all in this together. Uh, We've talked about a mentality of, O come, Lord Jesus, come. We've talked about a seriousness in which we should take our, our position before God. What's the one big thing? 
What's the one, if we can go to that slide, please, Elijah. What's the one big thing that stems out? What's the one big thing that God has put on your heart? What's the one big thing that you are challenged and encouraged to do something? Sorry, Elijah, next slide, but uh, do something with. What is that for you? What is the one big thing? Uh, please, uh, will you join with me in prayer? Uh, dear Lord, um, thank you for this series. I, I pray that you have really changed lives through the preaching of your word in this series, that you've enabled us to uh, examine uh, bits of scripture that we may have previously avoided to get into too deep. We praise you, Lord, for this chapter in which we're encouraged in terms of, of leadership, in terms of church unity, in terms of giving. I ask, Lord, that you would encourage each and every one of us with one big thing, something we can take home, something we can do differently as a result of. Challenge us, Lord, to be different as a result of your truth being preached today. We give this to you in your name. Amen. Uh, we're going to conclude our time.